Okay, it looks like we're ready to get started. Good afternoon and welcome to our conversation with college leadership. I am Deanne Johnson. I'm the Assistant Dean for Advancement in the College of Media. Today's event is being recorded, but none of your personal information will be captured during the broadcast. After the event, the recording will be posted on the College of Media's website. We received an abundance of questions from our alumni and friends, so to optimize our time with you today, we've selected several to answer. We are not able to take questions live, so at the end of the presentation, there will be an email address and you can submit questions there. Before we start, please make sure to mute your audio. Now let me introduce you to our panelists. Dr. Tracy Sulkin, Dean of the College of Medicine, uh, Media, <laughs> Dr. C.L. Cole, Professor and Head of the Department of Media and Cinema Studies, Dr. Stephanie Kraft, Professor and Head of the Department of Journalism, and Dr. Mike Yao, Professor and Head of the Charles H. Sanders Department of Advertising. I hope you all enjoy our conversation today and thank you for joining us. Please welcome Dean Sulkin. Thanks very much, Deanne. Um, I'm so glad that so many of you have chosen to close out your work days uh, with us here today. And if you're like all of us, your commute from uh, work life to home life will be very short once this wraps up. So um, it goes without saying that these have been really unprecedented times for the College of Media, for the University of Illinois, and for the world beyond. And so we're really looking forward to this opportunity to share some updates with you and also to share the questions um, that you have had for us uh, with, with all of those who are joining us today. Um, for students, faculty, and staff at the university, including the College of Media, the shifts that have been made over the past several months have really been monumental and astounding in scope. Right? We moved almost overnight, but not without a lot of planning, um, to offering all of our instruction remotely, to reconfiguring how uh, studying is done for students, how research is conducted for our faculty members, how services are provided by our staff members. We brought our workspaces and our operations home. And this has come with a number of challenges, of course, right? Day-to-day -day ones for faculty, staff, and students alike who are finding themselves balancing full-time education or full-time work with the needs to homeschool their children or provide childcare or deal with other household obligations. And of course, it's also been the case that there are many in our community who've been affected by very serious health or financial challenges as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. At the same time, though, in the face of all this, um, it's also been the case that it's been a truly inspirational time to be part of the University of Illinois and the College of Media. So if you've been following the news updates from campus, you know about innovations such as the prototype ventilator that was created here, the data modeling of the epidemic that's been shaping statewide policy on this, and the ways in which colleagues from colleges across campus have come together to produce PPE and sanitizer to protect the community. Um, for the college, I hope that you're following along at home on our new Eye on the Media series, which uh, highlights our faculty experts offering insights into the many aspects uh, of the current reality uh, that COVID-19 has brought about. Um, in all, I've been so impressed, although I've said a number of times, not at all surprised to see how our faculty, staff, and students have really risen to the occasion. Um, it's a great privilege to be part of this community, to get to work with such wonderful colleagues, and to be part of such a talented uh, leadership team in the college. And you'll get to be hearing from our department leaders um, in just a few minutes. So uh, without further ado, I think it's time to get to our questions and Deanne is going to be coordinating that for us today. We received, a quest we, we received questions from several alumni interested in an overview of and update on the College of Media programs. And Tracy, can you share some more information on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. I, I was looking at the list of attendees today um, and we have folks with us who are very recent graduates and folks whose Illinois experience goes back over half a century. And so as uh, we have adapted and innovated, there have been changes to our curriculum over time. Um, so today we have about a thousand undergraduate students and over a hundred graduate students. And there are 51 faculty who are part of the college, uh, three of whom, one in each unit, will be joining uh, the faculty anew in the fall for the first time. And, and we're looking forward to welcoming them. Um, we offer undergraduate degrees in advertising, in computer science plus advertising, in journalism, and in media and cinema studies. 
We have undergraduate minors in public relations, in cinema studies, uh, in journalism, and then two new minors, which are um, soon to, to be offered, um, one in critical production in the Department of Media and Cinema Studies, and then a new college-wide minor uh, in media that's designed to bring students from across campus some of the advantages of a college of media education. And we also offer certificate programs in media production, in sport media, and in media sales at the undergraduate level. Uh, at the graduate level, we offer master's degrees in advertising and in journalism. We have an online strategic brand communication degree that's led by our Department of Advertising. And of course, we have our interdisciplinary doctoral program, the oldest in the world in communication and media studies, that's housed in our Institute of Communications Research. So our curriculum and our programs really bring together a fascinating and unique set of approaches and perspectives. From the liberal arts, we have perspectives from the humanities and the social sciences. And of course, we offer the pre-professional education that our practitioners are so um, good at working with our students with. Um, and then finally, we're very enriched by the presence of Illinois public media, including WLL TV and radio, which are also a part of the College of Media. <laughs> Many of our alumni expressed interest in learning more about how the current circumstances surrounding COVID-19 have affected the college. For example, what was the transition to online teaching like for students and faculty? Mike, can you lead us off? Yes, hi, um, Dia and, and Diane and Tracy, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will just quickly uh, address the questions uh, on the COVID-19 transition and then probably have an opportunity to um, share more of my uh, our thoughts. Um, it really, it's a pleasure being here and thank you for participating. Um, so Department of Advertising is, um, you know, vibrant and then we have really gone through uh, quite a transition recently and really significantly grown our uh, faculty size and, and also student. Uh, um, and we're doing a lot of exciting new things. And uh, even before the COVID-19 um, pandemic happened. But specifically, uh, in response to the COVID-19 um, situation, we have done a few things, uh, both on the faculty side and also the student side, to um, address the concerns, both immediately, as well as um, um, it's also looking forward to the future. So in overall, the transition to uh, remotely teach uh, has been pretty smooth within our department, uh, considering the circumstances and how rapidly we had to respond to the needs of students and faculty. And our students and faculty have shown remarkable resilience and adaptability and, and professionalism. So as Tracy mentioned earlier, it's really during these difficult times we see how much uh, our students and faculty member can, can do. So on the faculty side, uh, at the beginning of March, uh, that's before the state governor uh, issued a state uh, home order, uh, it, it, when situation was sort of um, becoming a bit more clear that uh, these orders are to come. And so in anticipation, the Department of Advertising conducted a series of virtual meetings as a way to kind of introduce the technologies like Zoom and Microsoft Teams to the faculty. So we were prepared in advance uh, before the campus order and then also the state order uh, were given. And then more than half, and we were also fortunate enough in the, in the position that more than half of our advertising faculty member uh, have, have already had previous experiences in developing and teaching online courses in the past uh, at the undergraduate and master's level, uh, both for developing the, our masters, online masters in strategic brand communication, as well as in um, trying to offer courses in the summer and the winter, and also uh, flip the classroom and as a part of our teaching innovation. Uh, practice. So we're in, a, we're in a pretty good position that at least more than half of our faculty member were ready and then they would be they were sharing their um, experiences with other faculty members uh, who have not had experience to engage in remote teaching. So in fact last year um, our one of our senior lecturers uh, Shahar Maron uh, won the campus-wide excellence in online education and distant learning award. And so he played a significant role in bringing in a lot of expertise and insights to uh, the faculty uh, and, and also helped us. And then the faculty also had a series of discussions and meetings and created a shared workspace for us to ask and answer questions about various issues we all run into in our classes. 
Um, on the student side, uh, most of the students have done well from uh, what I've heard. We did not run into any major issues. Um, we did have some um, isolated incidents and reports from students who have approached our faculty member and also the student services team and reporting issues related to studying environment at home, uh, ac access to technology, grading issues. And these cases were handled individually and on a case by case situation by the excellent student service team in the college in coordination with our faculty members and according to policies and guidelines uh, provided by the university. Um, so just very quickly, I would like to share a few things that we did in different types of classes. So for the lecture heavy courses, most of our faculty members produced video lectures in advance and complemented those video lectures with live discussions on Zoom. And this arrangement uh, worked very well and students uh, were, were, were um, able to uh, get both. So to think of it as a more of a flipped classroom situation, they still get teaching material well in advance uh, without having to log in and, and adding a lot of demand to the technological resources but are able to meet uh, frequently on a weekly basis, uh, engage with other students and, and faculty members. So courses with some uh, heavy student group interactions, uh, such as our class uh, on um, consumer insights, were a bit more challenging. Um, for example, uh, Brittany Duff, who teaches a faculty member who teaches um, the consumer insight class and really heavily relies on in-class interactions in her discussion sections. And so she, um, you know, shared some experiences and did a fabulous job in redesigning the assessment plan and these assignments uh, in response to a remote teaching environment. And then so far, I've, I've received, um, you know, nothing but really excellent reviews in, in how well that went. And um, on the project-based courses, we have a number of project-based uh, courses. So for the Sandwich Project, which is a capstone for our advertising major, uh, students typically work in teams and uh, on, on nonprofit projects from real uh, clients. And um, so usually at the end of the year, the students will have these gatherings and presentations. And um, so obviously this year, these presentations will have to be done remotely and the students submitted videos. And some of these projects were actually very ex uh, exciting uh, and then provided some opportunities for our students and faculty to work with uh, other faculties, uh, depart other departments. So for example, um, you know, we collaborated with uh, journalism on a project uh, that's data-based uh, uh, journalism called CU Citizen. And then I'm sure Stephanie would, would say more about that project later. Um, I, I myself, I also teach a project-based course in uh, the CS Computer Science Plus Advertising Program. And uh, students typically work in groups uh, these students are from both computer science majors and also advertising majors, and um, they work together to tackle a, you know, problem in a grand challenge in advertising with innovative technological solutions. So this year, they were asked, at the beginning of this year, they were asked to uh, develop a redesign the Facebook's privacy and advertising preference settings to offer consumers more control over how their data will be shared and used in targeted advertising. So these projects were evaluated by uh, product designers in uh, Yahoo this year and also a design expert from Siebel Center for Design. Now, I originally planned a, a very big sort of at the end of the semester um, show uh, gathering to present their work uh, because they did a fabulous work, a fabulous job. Uh, but uh, they instead uh, had to submit videos, uh, but I, they also uh, created uh, websites um, so in, in a way, they learn more uh, in this remote teaching environment than uh, I originally had anticipated because they were switched to building a website and present their ideas you know, on an interactive medium. Uh, and so this was a, uh, something that actually turned out better than I expected. Uh, and finally, I think a lot of our students are still participating in research. And this just very quickly, uh, this morning, I got the uh, very exciting news that our uh, this year's virtual uh, undergraduate research symposium uh, at this event, uh, our student won the big award, uh, the uh, won an award uh, uh, with a project. So again, our students are doing well and they're resilient and they're doing everything they can to uh, stay to stay excellent in, in, in this environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That is exciting. Uh,
Nicole, would you like to share a little about what's happening in Max? Sure, thank you, Deanne, and thank you, Tracy. Um, and thank you, everyone who's participating today. Um, I think Mike really neatly summarized the way that the faculty across the college rose to, um, to, to the challenges that were posed by, by the pandemic and moving to an online environment. Um, I also think there was a recognition um, that, that in this case, it was um, among the Max faculty and I'm sure among the faculty in the college that um, this meant more than teaching online, it was teaching in the context of, of really, you know, a global epidemic, a trauma of, of sorts, and that that had to be factored into um, um, all of the considerations that, that went into um, redesigning the classes online. Um, let me give you just one example of what a Max faculty member did. Max offer, offers a, a 400 level course, so it's an advanced course um, in film festivals. And in that course, students are offered the opportunity to develop, a, in the past, an in-person um, film festival from the beginning to the end. So from the, the call for submissions to the moment, um, you know, the, 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 um, the films are screened and awards are given. So the students in this class got a very different real world experience than the students in the past. And they met that challenge even to the call for submissions, which um, um, I think just demonstrates the thoughtfulness that, that went into this. So this year, instead of calling for films in particular categories, um, like social justice or maybe, you know, documentary um, or, or fiction. Um, the call went for short films, which would be the traditional sort of films that we would expect students to submit under regular circumstances. Um, and the second category was home movies. And uh, this decision was made by the students and the faculty member thinking about um, what kind of materials the students would have access to and what kind of materials they would no longer have access to. On campus, they might have access to pretty high-end production equipment at home. They might have access to um, videos that their parents um, or they took or uh, photographs uh, that they could then organize into a home movie. And, um, and perhaps most impressively, um, the group decided to offer um, submissions in the category of TikTok, which is a popular um, app um, among our undergraduates and high school students. And in that case, uh, the invitation was not necessarily to uh, students who were um, committed to filmmaking, but to all students who were interested in expressing themselves creatively through, through media. So the call went out in those three categories. Um, um, the, the students in the, this class received almost um, 100 submissions. Um, just a really exciting um, um, opportunity for the students and for those who submitted. Um, and then the students had to think about, okay, now how are we going to present the, the films? You know, and, um, they, they decided that they would try to stream the film festival online, which, you know, at first glance might seem simple, but they had to find a platform that would work for them. And they rose to the challenge. Uh, they overcame numerous obstacles. Um, and they did find a, a live uh, streaming platform. They eventually used their own website to live stream um, the films. And uh, this year, we had over 500 uh, views. So we're very, very excited about that. And I think one of the things that we'll see from that going forward is a revision of our film festival. I think going forward, we'll be rethinking whether or not we want to call this a film and media festival, because you can't really talk about TikTok as, as, as film, um, or maybe you can, maybe film is being reconfigured in, in this moment. Um, and um, yeah, let me stop there with that. So 
um, really impressed with the faculty and um, the students um, in just really unsettling times. Thanks. Thank you, Cole. That's fantastic. Our next question is from an alum who asked how students' internship experiences have been affected by COVID-19 and how this is being addressed by departments and the college. Stephanie, can you share some, th some thoughts on that? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, thanks. And uh, thanks for everyone who's joining us today. Uh, it's really exciting to see all the uh, attendees in the list. Um, as the journalists on the list can tell you, it's not the greatest time in the world to um, be looking for an internship or a job in journalism necessarily. However, um, I'm happy to report that we do have some students whose internships seem to have uh, are going to proceed as usual. But we also um, decided in light of all of these events and the many internships that didn't kind of survive um, to get a little creative. We are very um, fortunate to have a variety of internship scholarships um, made available by generous donors, some of whom are on this list. And so we worked um, out kind of a win-win situation with some of the local nonprofit uh, reporting ventures and other kinds of um, uh, helpful folks to create internship opportunities for students so that they would have a chance, even in a part-time remote way, to continue to build their skills, have something to put on their resume. And so I'm really happy to say that we have at least 10 internships that we've created this way um, at a variety of outlets from WILL to the Midwest Center for Investigative Reporting to CU Citizen Access, uh, the Illini Inquirer, which is a sports site. Um, even Uni High has quite a lot of communications work that they do with alumni outreach and so on. And there's an intern who'll be placed there. And so we've been able to, to um, leverage those funds to create these um, opportunities that would not have otherwise existed. These aren't organizations that would typically have money um, to pay interns. And so um, those scholarships are going to help support that effort and, and also the effort of um, and the expenses of students who did get um, and still have internships from other entities. We have someone interning at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, for example, who's being um, additionally supported with, with some of our funds. And so we're pretty excited to be able to, to offer that kind of, of support. Um, and I think that, um, oh, I forgot one. The uh, American Society of Magazine Photographers, I mean, media photographers also offered a variety of online internships. So um, I'm really happy that we're able to, to do this for people. And I think that it will give us an idea um, for future use as well. I mean, in the past, we've, we've supported students who've done internships before, but um, hadn't really thought about, you know, with any excess funds that we might have, you know, creating these opportunities. And so that's something that we might be taking forward, um, kind of a lesson learned from this situation. That's great. Thank you so much. Looking ahead now to next academic year, we received a question about what the college's fall enrollment numbers look like. Tracy, what do you know about that at this point? At this point? Yes, yeah, so um, our deadline for students to let us know if they were going to um, be joining us in the fall has passed now, so we have some really good numbers uh, and good sense of where we will be in the fall. Um, the university has continued to enjoy really robust student demand. That's a sign of the, the quality of its programs and the strength of its reputation. Uh, and the college and media and its programs are no different. Um, so the number of new students who plan to join us in the fall is down by just a handful of students over where we were last year. And last year was a recent historical high for us. Um, so we feel really good about where we are for fall. Um, we feel good about the experience we'll be able to offer to students. And I think if nothing else, what we see going on in the world right now has really underscored the importance of media. Uh, and my expectation is that we're gonna see increased interest from students over the years to come, um, especially when you think about all of the ways you've heard already about our, how our departments are innovating um, and helping our students to navigate this new reality. That's great. Now a question for all of you. And that is perhaps the one looming most on everyone's minds. 
what does fall semester look like? Tracy, can you lead us off? Um, sure, right, that's, that's the big question right now. And I think like our peers all across the country, um, the university has been involved in round the clock planning. I'm literally 24 hours a day trying to figure out um, the best plan for fall. Um, we expect um, a plan in mid-June will be shared that will share some specifics and details about what fall semester will look like. There are many task forces and committees on campus that are ironing out those details as we speak. Um, based on what we know right now about the pandemic, based on the, the data modeling that's helping us to make predictions about the future, um, including uh, those models created by our own researchers here at the university, and we're hopeful that fall will be a hybrid of in-person instruction and remote instruction. Um, we expect that there'll be a significant online presence um, and that this will be important in a variety of ways. Um, the first thing it will do is that it will enable us to accommodate social distancing in those courses that do use in-person. Um, and it's also gonna enable us to provide an accessible and flexible alternative for students and faculty who are unable to participate in an in-person instructional environment in the fall. The first priority for the university, for the college, for our departments um, is safety, right? Not just in the classroom, but across campus, right? If we're thinking about residence halls, or we're thinking about the union, or we're thinking about um, those of you who remember what the first floor of Greg Hall looks like in the passage between classes, right? There are all sorts of those issues that are being worked through right now. Um, of course, any plans that are announced um, will continue to be modified and refined um, as we receive directives from Governor Pritzker and as we take into account the latest uh, information from state and local public health experts. Cole, would you like to um, answer as well? Yeah, at, at this point, it's hard to predict what, what fall is going to bring. Uh, I think that faculty are uh, waiting for more information about um, what's going to be possible and what's going to be um, safe, as the dean said. Um, so we're preparing for a number of, of different possibilities for all of our classes. Um, we do have some faculty who um, would like to make decisions now, and the university um, is very open to that. You know, some of the faculty want to teach online and, and want to move forward with that. Um, those who uh, would like to, to teach face-to-face, -face, if they have that opportunity, um, think they're, they're looking forward to the university providing um, important and needed guidance about how to do this in the safest way possible. Step. Um, thanks. Yeah, we uh, also have, you know, been dealing with the same uncertainty as everyone else, but we're trying to do a couple of different things. One is we're trying to kind of think about the lessons learned from, you know, albeit a kind of sudden switch to remote instruction, but I think there were some valuable things that we learned about ways we can deliver courses that you wouldn't necessarily think would be deliverable um, in a remote kind of way. And so um, when we had to go to remote instruction, um, particularly the, the courses that involve lots of cameras and things, uh, we made sure to um, send students home with as much equipment as possible, but we also have found um, that you know, smartphones are great for instruction and some basic principles of shooting and recording and so on. And so, um, you know, looking ahead, like I said, we're, we're trying to kind of think about, you know, some of those lessons, should we have to go to um, a remote setting, you know, in the fall, who knows what will happen, we can do that. Um, one of the other lessons that we kind of learned, um, too, is that it isn't just about how any particular course is delivered. It's kind of not just about what the instructor is doing. Our students really seem to miss the experience of being in a lab together with other students learning from one another. And so one of the things that we're looking at now, and this is not just our department, but the college, is figuring out a way to have a virtual lab kind of experience available for students so that they can, even if they are, you know, in their residence halls, kind of hunkered down, they can still be working with people in a virtual lab. We could have 
virtual lab monitors, well, actual people, but virtually uh, monitoring the lab and being available for questions and so on, but trying to recapture um, that, that um, team kind of, you know, helping each other out sort of thing is something that we're going to be looking at for fall. In journalism in particular, we're also thinking about um, just very, from the very kind of mundane sorts of things of, you know, can we buy a few more extra cameras to limit how much check-in, check-out kind of activity needs to go on and a lot of transferring, um, you know, uh, and so on, in addition to kind of thinking about the, all of the social distancing and how to put on some of the different shows that we have in a socially distanced way and so on. Um, I think between kind of the, the virtual lab experience, the um, additional equipment, um, the use of, or at least our knowledge that we can use some smartphone stuff in delivering some of those courses, that'll be good um, going forward. You know, that'll kind of prepare us for, for some of the instructional challenges we might face. Um, like everyone else, we're, we're kind of thinking about which, um, you know, beyond just those courses that, that offer or that require cameras and equipment and things that you touch and, and so on. We are also trying to think about how to best do the, um, the discussion oriented courses like the ethics course, um, the history course that includes a lot of discussions, some of the other upper division courses. And so um, the experience that people had this spring with kind of a hybrid of you know, doing synchronous discussion and asynchronous instruction and so on, um, we'll be building on that. I'm, I'm talking to all the faculty individually about kind of options and, and what resources they might need to, to be offering um, their courses in different kinds of ways. Thank you, Stephanie. Mike, can you tell us about what's happening in advertising? Yeah, sure. Um, so in addition to um, what Stephanie and um, Cole had said about the smaller classes, uh, we are um, exploring similar options. Um, but I, I perhaps I'll focus a little bit more on the larger classes and what we're doing because advertising had, uh, have more um, lecture style larger courses and some of our undergraduate courses are quite large uh, and also mixed with discussion sections. So in addition to some of the practices we shared, uh, the faculty, some of our faculties uh, is getting together our, uh, in the summer to share our ideas and then explore various technology and platforms that allow us to um, deliver uh, experiential learning virtually through technology and because that's what we study and that's what we know well. But in addition, larger classes can be very challenging because um, just, you know, remote distancing, uh, sorry, social distancing requirement dictates that if you have a class of, you know, let's say 30 students and then you have to adhere to the remote uh, uh, social distancing requirement, we'll have to find spaces and coordinate them so that they can be stay apart. So it's very likely, um, although the university have not uh, made a decision and officially sent out the comment, but we are really prepared uh, for a variety of scenarios. And then the most scenario that we anticipate is that the larger courses, some of our larger courses will, be have, to, will have to be taught remotely. Um, so for example, our introduction to advertising class has over 300 students. And so we've already start, uh, begun uh, discussions with the e-learning specialists on campus and also the faculty, uh, um, Steve Hall, who teaches that class. And we're exploring how do we uh, create a very dynamic experience and, and maintain the quality. Uh, research methods, brand strategy, and introduction to digital advertising. Some of these lecture style courses uh, we are preparing to offer them remotely um, if, if this is the requirement. Um, for the remaining courses with a, a discussion sections or uh, in the lecture, we're exploring various uh, options, perhaps a mix of remote teaching and on-site teaching. And we'll make these decisions uh, about those courses after we get more uh, concrete guidelines from the campus. Uh, but in general, most of us are prepared to, to kind of teach remotely and we're looking for innovative ways to, to make these remote teaching course uh, experience more than just delivering online videos and lectures. As Stephanie and Cole had alluded to, I think we can do more and we are doing more uh, uh, to explore these options. And also, uh, finally, in addition, we are uh, really looking closely at our um, uh, existing curriculum to sort of move, using this opportunity to move some of our popular courses uh, that can be uh, 
offer to the public as a professional uh, certificate, for example, our sales certificate sequence, uh, this isn't actually an opportunity for us to uh, incorporate an online mode of teaching as a strategic development. I'll, I'll, later, I'll, I'll probably share a little bit more about our thinking on this. But the idea is that, you know, if we are, um, if we are uh, sort of forced or asked to teach these classes remotely, what are the courses that are um, uh, better suited to offer and scalable to offer to the big public and use this as a strategic opportunity? And what are some of the courses that we should uh, uh, be more innovative and, and, and find ways to offer them in a smaller setting? But if we have to offer them virtually, and how do we do it better? And also looking closely at our curriculum and understand what are some of the courses that it's ideal to offer in, in person. And we would um, advocate and, and find out the, the best option for us to offer those experiences in person. Thank you all. Those are uh, some really wonderful ideas and uh, looking forward to finding out how this goes. Um, another question we received is about scholarships. So in particular, what types and how many scholarships are available for students while they are, they're enrolled in the College of Medicine? Tracy, would you like to talk about this? Um, in the College of Media, we're really fortunate to have um, a robust scholarship portfolio, especially for a unit of our size. Um, that's thanks to many of the folks who are, who are listening in today and their generosity in helping our students. We offer 85 uh, new scholarships to students each year. That doesn't include continuing scholarships for a student who might um, get funding as a, as a freshman, undergraduate, and then have that continue through their time here. Um, we also offer fellowship funds to graduate students, again, as a function of the generosity of our, of our alums. Um, to undergraduate uh, new and continuing students, we distribute a total of about $350,000 um, a year. Of course, student need continues to outstrip our supply of available funds, right? The funds that we offer in the college are in addition to funds offered by the university or, or private scholarships. Um, but even then, there's a lot of unmet need for students. Um, and we expect that this is only going to increase as students' families grapple um, with some of the financial realities that are being brought about um, by COVID-19. Um, scholarships uh, include both what we kind of think of as a traditional scholarship that might help a student with tuition and fees, and then as Stephanie noted, uh, things like internship support is al also really valuable. Um, and that is something that all three departments have given a lot of thought to supporting, right? So it's about helping students to um, really be benefiting from the full experience in the College of Media, um, which includes classes, but it also includes these really critical co-curricular experiences. Um, and again, our alums have been very generous in, in helping us to provide that support, uh, much needed support to our students. Thank you, Tracy. Several alums asked what we are hearing about graduating students' placements and what the college plans are to help students navigate the challenging COVID-19 job market. Mike, would you like to share what you're hearing from students? Yeah, um, just so my information is uh, some of anecdotes, just uh, relying on um, alums and, and, and um, also our faculty feedback. And then also I got some students uh, sending me emails in the summer. Um, I think uh, Stephanie earlier alluded to that um, the job market will be challenging. I've heard from uh, numerous sources that uh, internship have been canceled or job offers being put on hold and students um, understandably are very nervous about it. So in a department, we, we have begun to have some uh, conversations about uh, to offer, uh, let's say, uh, postgraduate courses, um, uh, opening up our master courses, master level courses to students if they're interested, and, and, and also develop professional certificate programs and courses and seek those opportunities to allow students to, to uh, continue their education at a, at a low cost and, and, and entry point just, you know, for the time being. In addition to that, I think we are um, we have the opportunity to, uh, it, this is really building on the momentum from um, uh, our Sandage Symposium uh, in March, and that it's, uh, we're building uh, great connections with the industry and with our alum base and with our um, and, uh, industry partners. And so I will continue actively uh, seeking those opportunities to secure internship and also uh, job opportunities, also for us to learn. I think these industry partnerships not only allow us to 
um, send our students to work for them, but it's a great way for us to learn more about the, uh, the, the trend, what's going on and what sectors are uh, uh, hiring. And then so we can uh, direct our students to these resources if needed. Uh, and so in the fall, uh, you know, you were using this opportunity to uh, develop a more coher coherent internship program and also to sh uh, create a shareable resource and then some of our faculty members are looking into the experiential learning immersion experiences and tie these experiences closer to the professional development and job market as well and, and beef up our professional training side and and finally um, i think our linkedin group uh, which was launched in january uh, it called Ad advertising at illinois has already over 900 members, close to 900 members, and we will continue to grow that platform. This is a great platform for students to seek mentorship from their uh, from alums, uh, stay connected with the department, and also it's a great platform for our alums or, or friends from the industry to post uh, job opportunities, the internship opportunities, and share resources and, and, and expert opinions. So, it's, so we're hoping to, to really ramp up the activities on that platform and um, to, to, to address these issues. But in general, I think um, advertising is an, an interesting space because on the one hand, um, the, you know, the, the entire job market is, is under siege because of the COVID-19 in, in a, a very broad level. But there are some um, shining uh, places, uh, for example, the digital advertising, the programmatic advertising. We work with uh, partners like the Trade Desk and some uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Verizon Media, and then these are places where, um, in fact, that I think there's some new opportunities being created. And then so we will uh, strengthen our partnership with these uh, industry partners and learn more about their needs and, and also uh, um, develop experiences for our student that they can better uh, be prepared, be better prepared for that uh, job market. Uh, when, when there are these threats, there's always opportunities. So we'll continue to look for these opportunities for our students. Um, and that's, um, I'll stop here. Thank you, Mike. We have a question by an alum about today's media climate. He asks, the explosion of accessible media, the internet, was envisioned to give everyone access to information. It has also given everyone access to misinformation. How can legitimate media sources teach people to distinguish the difference in this climate, will anyone pay attention? Stephanie, I know that media literacy is one of your areas of scholarly exper expertise. What are your thoughts on this? Well, great question. <laughs> Who has an answer? No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, it is a great question, and you're right. I mean, the, the notion that there's this wide open, very democratized kind of platform where everyone can share information looked like it was going to be a great thing, right, up until it kind of wasn't. Um, I do think that um, it's interesting to think about 20 years ago and, and how limited choice really framed how people interacted with news, right? It, it wouldn't have really occurred to people um, to be questioning things about source credibility in the same way that they are now. I mean, there was a limited number of sources to go to um, you came to depend on them or to not like them and find a different source, you know, as you wished, but you really weren't kind of overwhelmed by choice and you weren't sort of faced with a whole bunch of lookalikes, you know, kind of mimicking in, in kind of surface features what it is that journalists do and so therefore being confusing. Um, the good news is that news literacy research, at least the, the parts that I have been involved in, have demonstrated that just teaching people about the news media system itself um, actually have, is related to um, better kinds of outcomes that we would care about, more political participation, less belief in conspiracy theories, more skepticism about news delivered via social media. And, and when I say that it's just knowledge about the system, it's things like people who know, um, for example, that news that shows up in your Facebook feed um, that happens as a result of an algorithm, as opposed to, you know, some other <laughs> way of happening. So people who know that the difference between kind of a commercial news outlet and a nonprofit news outlet, 
people who kind of know how public relations and press releases sort of fit into the, the media landscape, things like that. Um, people who know, for example, that newspaper uh, websites, you know, with the exception of very few of them, actually don't really operate at much of a profit at all. So these kind of more general questions about the system and knowledge about those things is related to having a better um, ability to kind of navigate and, and understand what's in the news media better. Um, there are, of course, a lot, I'm sure the people out there are saying, yeah, but there are a lot of other questions that relate to that. But the, when I say that that's good news, the good news is that those are the kinds of things that news organizations don't necessarily have to teach, right? Those are things that educators can teach. Those are things that can show up um, in curriculum of, at all different levels. And so um, the notion that on top of everything else that news organizations are doing in an attempt to survive, that they have to take on the entire burden of, um, you know, distinguishing themselves from bad players and misinformation, you know, at least we know that there are things that can be done via other educational efforts um, that do make a difference. Thank you, Stephanie. Further down the road, what do you expect spring 2021 to look like for immersion programs and study abroad? Tracy, do we know yet about those plans? We don't at this point. For, for those of you who um, are kind of following along with the news from the university, among the very first decisions related to COVID-19 um, involved uh, study abroad programs and bringing students home from those. Um, and our immersion programs are in many ways like a domestic study abroad program um, where students will travel um, to media outlets, um, a variety of them in a, in a given city or cities in order to learn to learn about those. You know, I expect that as the summer and fall come further along, um, we, will, we will learn more about what those plans are. And, and of course, as we've all seen, there's going to be a difference between maybe what's technically permissible and, and where there's demand, right, and what's, what's advisable. And we'll be working um, with our student services folks and with our students and with our faculty um, to make those decisions as we have more information. Um, if actual travel is not possible for a while, we'll be working on providing virtual sorts of experiences for students um, so that they're not missing out, um, particularly on those immersion experiences, which we know are, are really so valuable for students. Thank you, Tracy. So we have a final question here. Um, let's see, get exactly to my point, please. As you look ahead, to the fall semester and beyond. There are challenges ahead of us to be sure, but what are you looking forward to? What excites you about the opportunities ahead? And Cole, could you lead us off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think for media and cinema studies, one of the things that I find most exciting is the, the development of our production curriculum. So over the last three years, Max has put a lot of energy into developing um, a series of production courses that work together nicely, not only with one another, but with the strength that, that Max is known for, which is history and theory. Um, at the beginning of this, this session, um, the Dean had mentioned some of the, uh, the new certificates and minors that we have in the college, and one is the critical media production certificate. And the reason we call it critical is because it brings with it sort of a combination of not just the technical media skills, but again, sort of the theory um, and um, a sort of conceptual uh, knowledge of the grammar that, that's used to, um, to produce different uh, media uh, products. So, um, I'm excited about that for a number of different reasons. I think it helps us um, uh, educate our students in ways um, that they need to be educated in the 21st century. Um, uh, it's a nod to what um, Stephanie was talking about earlier in terms of media literacy. It, it, it is a form of media literacy. Um, students need to, to understand, um, we all need to understand at this point, um, what it means to, to um, or how it's possible to, to produce different kinds of stories 
using different forms of, of technology and how those different truths are produced and how we can understand how those, those truths are, are being produced. Um, uh, it's also a nod to what Mike was talking about in terms of the, the future of our, our students and the kinds of jobs that are going to be available to them. Um, on one hand, they were, we're sort of in this unknown territory, and on the other, we're, um, um, we're looking at a, a moment where no industry has been untouched by, by changes in technology. And so uh, students in uh, media and cinema studies um, uh, don't necessarily need to go into the media industry per se. They could um, uh, work for the local bank, you know, uh, uh, developing their, their uh, media needs. Um, and finally, um, uh, I just learned that one of our, our, our undergraduates, Caitlin Johnson, was accepted into the film school at NYU. Uh, for this coming fall, and um, I don't want to take any credit away from Caitlin. She's an exceptional, exceptional student, um, and I would hope that that the, the the curriculum that we're now providing that bridges media production and uh, history and theory gets simple in, in helping her get into the school. So um, I'm really looking forward to Max continuing what, what it's doing with, with production. That's wonderful. Thank you. Stephanie? Well, I, um, I think we can all agree that there's never been a better time to study media. And from the perspective of journalism, I cannot imagine a better time to study journalism, um, whether or not one intends to become a working journalist uh, at the end of it. So um, I'm pretty excited about the, the kinds of things that we're going to be able to offer students, both those who are professionally minded and wish to become journalists, and those who don't. And I'm, I'm thinking of things in particular like um, a lot more experience in data journalism and data visualization um, and a lot more um, exposure to some of the other kind of emerging storytelling technologies in journalism like augmented and virtual reality. Um, the faculty member who's working in that area now has a lot of interest in thinking about uh, the role that those kinds of technologies, and Mike can probably speak to this as well, play in um, engendering empathy for people in particular situations. And I, I'm just thinking about the, the possibilities here of the kind of storytelling, and not only about COVID and that pandemic, but just the opportunity to give our students a chance to learn how to do those things um, that will position them really well in the, in the job market, but will also make all of our lives better, right? If we have those kinds of storytellers uh, unleashed upon the world. So I, I'm, I, I recognize that there are a lot of things to be maybe not so happy about with the current situation, you know, in our industry and in the in the nation. But I I do think that um, it is a really exciting time to be able to study journalism and again to be able to offer students um, opportunities to kind of do things in in ways that they hadn't thought about at all in high school that they probably weren't even aware were part of journalism in high school. And so we're working pretty hard to, to offer those opportunities to even maybe um, delve into the graduate certificate kind of model to offer some of those opportunities to mid-career journalists and to really kind of expand um, our data journalism presence um, in general, both in terms of teaching and in, in research. Thank you, Stephanie. Mike? Yeah, um, so following the excellent points uh, that Stephanie and Cole had made, I, I just, I just want to share that my view on this, that, that if we are living in a mediated society, so understanding media is what we do. And, and so this is a, a very, you know, not the best circumstances, but it's an exciting time to be a part of the college media, both as a faculty member, researcher, as well as a student. Um, but more specifically, looking at the future uh, and beyond, uh, I think the, the theme has, we have determined that is really about articulating uh, a experience and advertising education experience being the birthplace of, uh, of uh, higher education and advertising. 
um, we are, um, you know, really looking at the future and say, well, what does it mean to, to be an advertising student at Illinois at this particular time? And so this particular fu future looking, uh, uh, forward looking theme will continue in the next, into the next year and uh, beyond COVID-19. And so this involves us to really start thinking about and focusing on the student's experience, the student journey. And so several things we're doing is to, to really uh, to, 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 home this, to home in this point. One is to bring, um, to, to beef up our experiential learning aspect of it. This is by working closely with industry partners, developing more courses that are experiential learning based, uh, practical and, and experience uh, broadly defined, and also linking uh, our faculty expertise. I mean, we have faculty members uh, are doing research on neuroscience, on, on virtual reality, and all of these cutting edge human technology interaction, artificial intelligence. And we're all studying and looking at these issues in the context of advertising. So how do we connect our research expertise with and infuse that, in, infuse that into the student learning experience is a, uh, a strategic priority. And the second strategic priority is to uh, look beyond post-19's higher education environment and use this uh, so to really seriously and strategically consider developing a sequence of online courses with high production value, similar to those in our online masters uh, in strategic brand communication degree, and also bring that kind of uh, capacity into our undergraduate experience. So to scale up our, uh, um, and, and our, um, and our course offerings, at the same time maintaining the uh, excellent education quality. So we are looking into that. And third, we are uh, partnering up with uh, other campus units such as Siebel Center for Design and the technology office to, to really envision and integrate and develop uh, a student-centered, forward-looking and future-proof learning experience in advertising. And then we, would, we, uh, we are working with the Siebel Center for Design this summer to, to look at this uh, human-centered design approach to curriculum design and start to make moves uh, in the next year, hopefully. And finally, uh, after uh, a slight delay because of COVID-19, we still anticipate the launching of the Hub for Innovation in Brand Communication and Advertising Technology. This is a hub supported by the campus um, that we will uh, uh, you know, bring together different partners under one roof to integrate research, experiential learning, professional training, and innovation under, the one, under one roof. And so these are uh, uh, just some of the strategic priorities and exciting opportunities from advertising. That's wonderful. Tracy, would you like to wrap that up? Yeah, I think that um, this year has been a time of really great momentum for the college and we're really looking forward to, to continuing that. I think to hear um, our department heads talk about the, the amazing activities that there, our faculty students are undertaking, um, the amazing initiatives of our staff and really the collaborative spirit um, that's pervading um, our culture now. It's really no surprise that I love going to work every morning, right? It's exciting to hear what we're doing. Um, even if now we're gathering uh, via Zoom at home, right, rather than in each other's offices on campus. Um, we're excited that we just wrapped up a very successful strategic planning process. When we kicked it off in September, we couldn't have predicted how the year would end, um, but we're putting the final touches on the report now. Um, it'll be shared on our website within the next week or two, so I hope that everybody um, takes the opportunity to take a look at that. Um, of course, the world is different now, and budget issues, for example, surrounding COVID-19 um, are going to need to be taken into account as we think about our activities. But I think it's also important, and to underscore everything that my colleagues have said today, to acknowledge that times of challenge can also be times for opportunity and innovation. And with the people we have, our faculty, our staff, and students, I have really no doubt that we're going to continue to be leaders in the field um, and really be the vanguard for how to navigate this new reality. And I think we talk all the time about how we're not alone in this. We have the support of our alums um, and helping to guide us as, and advise us as we make these as we make these decisions and to support us um, and most importantly our students um, as as we move forward. So it, it's really been wonderful to get the chance to connect with everybody today, and we're looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you to all of you for spending some time with us this afternoon. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If something you heard sparks a question, please feel free to send it to me at the email address, which is now on the screen. 
There are many ways you can support the college, our students, and faculty. If you are interested in learning more, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Again, my email address is on the screen. <clears throat> we are grateful for each and every one of you and want you to know how much you mean to us. We hope you stay safe and well during this unprecedented time in our lives. Have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you again soon.